Welcome to part two of my top 20 non-superhero graphic novels. Today, I'm going to talk about the last half of that list. So we got 10 today. If you haven't seen the first video, maybe you should go back and watch it. Again, there are no manga or European or comic books that have been translated into English on this list. Those comic books will appear later in other lists. And just a reminder, this is my personal list. So, as I said before, it's all subjective. All right, let's find out what made the cut. And then you guys can leave comments down below to let me know what you would have added. You knew it was coming the moment that I said BKV's name would show back up on this list. And this is Why the Last Man. This time, Brian K. Vaughn is teaming up with Pia Guerrera. In this post-apocalyptic tale, yes, yes, it's another one. Believe me, I wanted to add Hickman's East of West, and it almost took its spot, but Why the Last Man is Still King. It is amazing. This book series from Vertigo, I think uh, started back in early aughts. Anyway, it takes place in a alternate 2002 where every living mammal on the planet with a Y chromosome mysteriously dies off. Except for Yorick and his pet monkey, Ampersand. With humanity now doomed to extinction, Yorick himself seems to be the key to redeeming the human race. But certain parts of an increasingly militant female society is also out to capture him. Yeah, you figured everybody would just want to have sex with this guy to repopulate the planet, but no, not at all. Some of them want to kill him because they are just happy with the way that society is without men and i think most men probably fantasize about that right what would it be like if you were the last man on earth well this shows you that it's not all fun and games it kind of sucks agent 355 i love 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 this book and no matter how much i talk about it i cannot do it justice the ending of the series is one that makes the whole roller coaster ride of emotions well worth it I remember 10 years ago when my wife and I were about to travel to Japan, we read the final volume in trade paperback and both of us held each other and cried. And it's, so it holds a special place in my heart. This masterpiece by Brian K. Vaughn is a title you cannot skip out on. You have to add it to your collection and that's why it's on mine. Here we go, Frank Miller. And I guess when most people think of Frank Miller, they probably think of some of his superhero books like Daredevil or Batman Year One, The Dark Knight Returns. But this is Sin City, which is a must read for comic noir fans, or I guess neo-noir, if you will. This is the book that shows us that he is truly a master of his craft. It is amazing, it's all done in black and white. But let me tell you a little bit about it first. So, this character named Marv wakes up next to this lady of the evening named Goldie, who, yes, she happens to be a prostitute, and she's seeking his protection. And he is completely in love with this woman. And he finds her dead. So he then sets out to find her killer and avenge her death in a city full of corrupt politicians and assassins and lowlife drunkards and some really fine-ass looking women too. I, I swear, the women that he draws in these, uh, top notch. Look at this stuff, black and white, contrast. Oh my God, this stuff is amazing. This is my favorite Frank Miller book. Yes, I know Wolverine is up there too, but if I had to pick between that and this, it would definitely be Sin City. This book just goes places you don't think it would go and I love it for that. It is a noir masterpiece. It is uber gritty and atmospheric. The stark balance of black and white artwork is striking and perfectly suited to his own story. And remember when I said damn fine looking women? That's what I'm talking about. If you've seen the movie, it is close to the source material, but you have to experience this by reading it. It is amazing. This is available in this big hardcover. There were also library editions and there's trade paperbacks. It's one of those titles that's evergreen for Dark Horse. They would be damn fools not to keep this always in print. Up next, we have Lock and Key. And this is a series that completely shocked me. This is the box set of the little hardcovers. There are master editions too. And of course, trade paperbacks. Let me just pull one of these books out. Yeah, this is one of those series that completely shocked me. I didn't think I was going to enjoy it as much as I did because it's one of those books that everybody was hyping up for me. But damn, everyone was right. Joe Hill, who happens to be the son of Stephen King, tells the story of the Locke family. So it's this group of family that move into Lovecraft, Massachusetts. Yeah, that's 
totally on purpose. My God, this artwork. I'll talk about the artwork here in a little bit. And in Lovecraft, Massachusetts, they move into a mansion known as the Key House. And then after Mr. Locke, the dad, is brutally murdered, they find some unexpected surprises in this home. Of course, yeah, very Stephen King-ish, right? Yeah, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. So the house is full of doors that require these special keys to open them up. And these special keys also grant people powers. It's pretty wicked. There also happens to be a vengeful spirit that's hanging out at the well. Every little piece of story in here does get resolved. The ending is very, very awesome. And believe me, you get sucked into wanting to know what key unlocks what power in people. It's really, really addictive. It's one of those books I couldn't put down. And I read the entire series in the span of probably four or five days. And I just did a reread a couple of months ago too. And it still, still holds the awesomeness that it was the first time I read it. It is genuinely creepy and un and it definitely has unsettling moments from time to time. And some images are just downright disturbing. I'm not gonna show any of those because they would probably spoil some. But those disturbing images are brought to you courtesy of Gabriel Rodriguez. I had never heard of this guy before and his artwork is fantastic. He's kind of a great blend, at least to me, of Arthur Adams, Jack Kirby, and Janet Paquette. So if you're a fan of the horror series or Stephen King, you definitely need to check this stuff out. It is awesome. It really, really lives up to the hype. And it's coming to a TV show near you soon. So here comes another book that I had to decide which one to showcase. And I've seen some of the comments from the last video and some of you had mentioned this. So yes, you knew it was coming. Criminal by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. And we know that the phenomenal team of, of Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips have done some amazing stuff like Sleeper, The Fade Out, Incognito, and those just are the ones that came to mind. And of course, I could have taken the easy route and said, yes, let's go ahead and do Gotham Central and focus on Ed Brubaker and Greg Rucka's awesome, awesome series. But that wouldn't have way too many superheroes and I thought that bended the rules way too much, which I'm gonna tweak the rules a little bit here, but I guess you'll see here in a minute. But this is criminal, and it's just that good. This is the damn book that set the bar high for the team up of Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, because this is the quintessential Brubaker series, at least to me. If you love crime, if you love crime noir, if you love neo noir, if you love Brubaker, if you just just freaking love comic books, this is the book for you. Even when you think you've got something figured out, it doesn't do you any good in the long run because Brew Baker just does this thing where he turns the story back on itself or twists it in, in different directions. This is a classic noir with a modern spin. And the world that Brew Baker's created here is rich and full of freaking characters. And these characters drift in and out of each other's lives in ways that makes you really feel like the criminal underground of Center City is real. And it all starts with my boy here, Lee Patterson who, guess what, he's a criminal. But he's one of my favorite Brubaker creations because he's just fascinating and brilliant and not your stereotypical criminal mastermind, or is he? Because the least I say about the book, the more you will enjoy it. You want a book to make you forget about superheroes? Well, look no further. I don't think I've read any crime noir comics that have ever left an impact like this book has. And this is now available in trade paperbacks. This is the hardcover from Icon, but now Image owns the trade paperback, so they are widely available. Remember when I said that thing about superheroes and tweaking the rules a little bit? Well, it's Hellboy, right? So yeah, kinda, no, maybe. I mean, I would call it a horror, sci-fi, fantasy, occult adventure. Not really a superhero book, but I mean, yeah, sure. At the end of the day, what really defines a superhero, right? It's not like Hellboy wears tights or can fly, but he's definitely got superpowers and he happens to save the day an awful lot. So ever since I was a kid, I was fascinated by horror movies. And that's why I got huge into the EC books and eventually what led me into the world of Hellboy. This is Mike Magnola's baby. And I will speak about the art in a little bit because you cannot not talk about Mike Magnola's artwork. So basically, Hellboy was summoned to the earthly plane during the tail end of World War II as a part of, you guessed it, a dark Nazi experiment gone wrong. And then baby Hellboy was found and adopted by this guy who would go on and create the Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense. Or, you guessed it, BPRD. Another great series. 
Didn't make the cut, but that's another great series. So if you enjoyed this, go read that stuff too. And then BPRD investigates all the manners of crimes relating to the supernatural and occult. So kind of like X-Files. And then in the present day, Hellboy is one of the star investigators. So it goes through different time periods, which I always thought was really cool. But what defines Hellboy is not really the monsters or creatures he ends up defeating, but the choices he makes along the way regarding his own destiny and the people that he cares about. And the cast of characters in here are really awesome. Looking at you, Lobster Johnson and Abe Sapien. Of course, Liz. Now, let's talk about Mignola's art style. This awesome artistic style that seems to share nearly as many influences as his history. Every page is dark, gothic, and filmed to the brim with blacks and shadows. His figures aren't incredibly detailed, but they don't really have to be. Look at this, this is amazing. In his case, in Mignola's case, style creates substance. It's it's the perfect balance of the art also carrying this wonderful, amazing story. Now, there are trade paperbacks, and recently they did a soft cover omnibus edition of this. But the way I get them is this oversized library editions. These are awesome, and there are seven of them, if I'm not mistaken, so far, including Hellboy in Hell. Spoilers. It was a tough choice between Karl Barks or Don Rosa. I mean, do you go with the guy, the good duck artist, the original creator of Uncle Scrooge, or do you go with the guy that took over his run and added to all the mythos? And I went with Don Rosa because I had to be true to myself. It is true, Don Rosa continued the amazing world of Barks and Disney ducks and added his own little mythos. Added it all to what Bark started. He took all of Bark's stories and made it into this chronological, could have happened kind of series of events. And he only takes Bark stories. That's it. He doesn't take anybody else's stories or borrows anything else from what the European artists have done or any of the cartoons had done. He only takes the comic stories that Barks did and he adds to them. The stories in these books are fun. The drawings are amazing and really, really detailed. And it's kind of funny how he started out tracing a bunch of Carl Barks in some of these earlier comics. By the time he gets to the life and times of Scrooge McDuck, you, you will see how much his art style is different and detailed. And let's not forget the characters. The characters that he brings to life in these stories, they are so much more relatable to me than actual human characters in most comic books. Scrooge, the nephews, the Beagle Boys, Gladstone Gander, Donald, Flint Hard Glomgold. I mean, there are so many characters in here, but I guess out of all of them, I relate more to Scrooge, especially the older and older that I get. These are stories that will make you laugh and stories that will make you tear up with happy tears. And they are all in these adventures here. I know that I said in my last video that Mouse is the one book that you must own in your library, but this is a series and especially the life and times of Scrooge McDuck that are a must read. If I could get you to read one thing out of both of these videos that I've done, it would be the life and times of Scrooge McDuck. Especially now that Fantagraphics has decided to reprint every one of Don Rosa's stories in these wonderful, wonderful hardcover editions. There are box sets available and some are out of print already, sadly, but the actual hardcovers are still available out there. And it's not just a book for comic book fans, but it's a book for anyone that loves reading. Young, old, it doesn't matter. This is the one series that out of all these videos, like I said, I hope that you read. Up next is a book by Fabio Moon and Gabriel Ba. And this is a book that has left a huge impact on my life. I waited a few years to read this one. This is Day Tripper by Vertigo Comics. But when I finally did in 2016, it became my favorite book I read that year and automatically moved up to one of those books that I probably would put in my top 10 favorite comic books of all time. So let's describe it. Briefly, keep in mind that this is a story about stories. It's a story about beginnings and endings. It is the story of Bras de Olivia Dominguez. And we see him, and this isn't really spoilers, because this is part of the story, die several times throughout the story. Pretty much at the end of each chapter, each issue, because there were 10 originally, and dies at different points in his life. But then he's back alive in the next issue. We witness a chapter of his life and death whether it be a metaphorical death or it just dreams in his life filled with endless possibilities of happiness and sorrow. These are the kind of stories that are close to my heart. Moon meditates on the important points in life. 
like family and living life to the fullest until your time is finally up. The book is part dream, part story, part memoirs of all of Bross's life. And this is a book I can't wait to discuss with my old reader, new readers group. I wonder what the ladies will think of this. And we'll be doing that episode live at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on September 25th. So it'd be great if you could join us. But anyway, this is one of those books I love and I quote, and I actually have a quote in here that I've got memorized. And it's from the dad when he's talking to Bras. And he said, life is like a book, son. And every book has an end. No matter how much you like that book, you will get to the last page and it will end. No book is complete without its ending. And once you get there, only when you read the last words will you see how good the book is. And I get a little misty-eyed thinking about that quote. But this is Day Tripper. This is available in trade paperback, this awesome hardcover, and there's an absolute coming out too. Remember when I said I could have cheated and just talked about Gotham Central because that was written by Ed Brubaker and Greg Rucka? Well, that's because I added Greg Rucka's Lazarus to this list. Available in trade paperback by Image Comics and hardcovers. This is still an ongoing series, but the world that he built... Well, I'll get to that here in a second, actually. Let's just, let me just tell you a little bit about what this is. Again, it's weird. Talking about these books, I don't think it does them justice. You just kind of have to experience them. So the story predominantly revolves around this character, the Lazarus, and her name happens to be Forever. She belongs to the Carlisle family. And by the way, Forever is also shortened to Eve or Ev. I assume they call her Ev just because of the word forever. Anyway, this world takes place in an alternate future where families act as government and cartel, own and control huge areas of land, and they exploit it to maintain the wealth and power of their families. And then each family has allies and enemies among the other families. And most families have a Lazarus and they live up to their biblical name because they come back from the dead. So yes, of course there's aspects of Raja Ghul and Wolverine that I think of immediately. Forever happens to be the Carlisle's Lazarus. And she appears to be the best model and one of the few that are completely artificial. She shows no signs of not being human, except when she's just brought back to life. She's a humanoid robot who's told she's cherished as a member of the Carlisle family, a family that calls her daughter and sister, but she's really just a disposable dangerous weapon. And that's when all hell breaks loose, is when she comes to the realization that that's all she is. This is a really violent series and featuring awesome sword fights and violence. It's great! And you really, really start caring about the Lazarus as the story progresses. And the bleak future isn't that far-fetched, honestly. It, the, the way that Michael Lark, yes, I haven't spoken about the art, but this is Michael Lark, which is just an amazing artist. He makes it very believable. He makes this world feel real. And to me, he is the ideal artist for this book. I know most people would probably put Love and Rockets on this list, but not this guy. This guy is more of a fan of Kachu and Francine than I am the Locas. And that's why I went with Terry Morse masterpiece, Strangers in Paradise. Yeah, I, I don't own the hardcovers. This is the softcover omnibuses. I wasn't lucky enough to get one of the hardcovers, but still, well worth it. I upgraded the trade paperbacks actually to this. This wonderful love story about two friends is the reason I love reading comic books. So you have the character of Kachu, which I mentioned earlier. She's portrayed as the angry and short-tempered blonde but happens to be pretty intelligent. And then you have Francine, who is almost painted at first as the weak and submissive person, but she shows flashes of brilliance and has a huge kind heart. Then you have David, who is probably the common thread of the book and that ties everything together. And he ends up pretty much growing immensely in the series, more than any of the other characters. And the main story concerns the complicated relationships between this group of friends as forces within and without threaten to tear them apart over the years. And it's really cool because I got to watch these characters grow. Some chose love and ch some not what society expected them to do. And others just got more selfish and greeter as they got older. I love the ending. There's several parts of this that made me tear up because it was just so depressing that thing, bad things kept happening to these pe wonderful people. And that's what they were to me. They were people. They never felt like comic book characters. They felt like real people, real friends that I would know. I cannot recommend this series 
highly enough to everyone that I know, including you guys watching the video. Because Terry Moore just has this rare talent for creating characters that feel so real. You can't help but empathize with them and then learn something about yourself in the process. He has a great ear for dialogue and definitely knows how to weave a story together. Along with his writing though, his artistic skills are really impressive. I love the way the characters change over time and he kind of grows, his art grows and you can see it from issue to issue. He gets better and better. This book came to me at a time that I needed it the most and it didn't let me down. It just picked me up. And these are available in trade paperback format and of course this omnibus format. I think this is still in print. And here we are with my final recommendation. The book that I'm sure everyone has on their list if they were to pick a top 20. And I guess, I'm sorry, I did say this list is subjective. Not everyone, but most people on the internet, on YouTube, on websites, on Reddit or whatever, I'm sure all have this in their top 10 comic books or favorite non-superhero comic book. But you know what? It doesn't matter because it's freaking Neil Gaiman Sandman and it belongs on everyone's list. Even if you're cheating just a tad because it does have aspects of superheroes, especially towards the beginning, when you show a little bit of the Justice League, the JSA and Batmans and characters from Infinity Inc. This was the series that established Gaiman as the author that he is today. I mean, without this series, I don't think the guy would have gone on and write episodes of Doctor Who or have several series based on his books or movies based on his books. So I mentioned earlier that the series shows some of the DC superheroes in here from time to time. Yeah, but it also has like Cain and Abel, some obscure characters. And that's what makes this book shine. It's obscurity. This was the Vertigo title that was the flagship title. This is what every Vertigo title wanted to be. Or for that matter, almost every independent book that was coming out at the time wanted to be Sandman. Or I guess wanted the fan base that Sandman had. The reason why people started wearing black to school. Okay, okay. Maybe one of the reasons why people started wearing nothing but black to school. At least in the late 80s and early 90s. This horror edge fantasy epic tells the story of Morpheus, who is the Sandman, the modern age Sandman, not the golden age guy with the gas mask, but we do see him from time to time. And towards the beginning, he escapes being held captive for 70 years. And then there's this family. Cause see, Morpheus is one of the endless beings older and more powerful than gods. Each of the seven ethereal beings embodies a different facet of existence. And this is really cool. So we have Dream, and we have his sister, Death, who I absolutely fell in love with. And you will too once you read this. Destiny, Destruction, Despair, Delirium, who is loosely based on Tori Amos, and Desire. And the beauty is how they interact with humans is what makes this series so amazing. It's dark, it's beautiful, and it's perfect. With dreamlike art from Sam Keith, they make all kinds of artists that started off in this series. P. Craig Russell and even Yoshitako Mano. It is mesmerizing. This series is definitely not one to be missed. It's not just a series, it's an experience. When you're reading Sandman, you are with the characters. It's got this perfect balance of hope and horror, dreams and nightmares, light and darkness, which happens to be a lot of the tones. And you see less and less character. Oh, death, how I love you. I definitely guarantee that you will fall in love with her character. This is the comic book that makes me glad that I still read comic books and I didn't give up on them. This is the comic that I give friends trying to get into comic books. Don't miss out on this amazing experience. Go check it out for yourself and see what all the hype is about. And there you have it. My top 20 non-superhero graphic novels. What did I leave off the list? Did I forget to put East of West, Casanova, Glory, Rachel Rising? Was it Blasphemous that I left out Walking Dead? Did you prefer Fatal instead of Criminal? Oh, believe me, I also wanted to add Transformers on their IDW run. But I guess those are kind of superheroes. Believe me, there were so many books I wanted to add. Like, I love EC Comics and I wanted to add some of that stuff. This was a really difficult list to come up with. Damn it. And Transmetropolitan almost made it into the list too. Like I said, this was a lot harder than I thought. I would love to know what you guys would put on there. You don't even have to do a top 20. You could do a top 10. Leave it in the comments down below. I'd love to know any suggestions because I may have not read it. Just because I've been reading comic books for over three decades doesn't mean that I've read everything. 
I'm sure there's stuff out there that are on people's list that I have not read yet. If this is your first time watching the show, please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. This was Omar. This was so much fun to do. And I want to keep doing other top whatever graphic novels. If you have ideas, leave comments down below and let me know what you want to see on this channel. And I mentioned our old reader, new readers um, segment that comes out every other Tuesday. We will be back on September 25th at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And don't forget to check out our weekly show where we talk about comic books, anime, video games, manga, and toys. Again, this was Omar. Thank you very much for putting up with me for two episodes and for watching my list. Have a wonderful day.